guess I guess this is time. Um, not sure if I think it is working. Hello. Um, but maybe that's okay. Can can every can everybody hear me fine? Okay, awesome. Uh, great. So uh, hello everyone. Thanks for coming. And uh, today I will be talking about uh, some of the big data trends that we observed at ODPI. So just in the matter of introduction, my name is Roman, and I happen to be a VP of technology of this non-profit organization called ODPI, uh, which is part of the Linux Foundation. So we do a lot of Hadoop and big data related activities, and we talk to a lot of end users, uh, projects, uh, constituencies within the enterprise, and today I would like to share that experience with you all. Uh, so ODPI, like I said, is my vantage point, and uh, if you're not familiar with the organization, ODPI is a non-profit organization committed to simplification and standardization of the big data ecosystem. So it was created about three years ago uh, by a whole bunch of companies, uh, Pivotal, Fortinworks, uh, IBM, a whole bunch of others. I will show you uh, all of the logos. And the initial, um, initial charter uh, for the organization was to basically try and standardize uh, the very high pace of development that used to happen in the Hadoop ecosystem. And if you remember the good old days of Hadoop distribution battles, right? You know, if you remember the my Hadoop is bigger than yours, you know, type of an argument that used to separate code there from Portworks and all the other distributions, you can kind of see that uh, it used to be the case that big data vendors, distribution vendors, uh, try to convince you that just their distribution, just them putting together all of that complexity on the right uh, was something of the value and something that would separate them from the back. And it was easy to understand why, uh, because I was actually lucky enough to be at Yahoo when Hadoop just got created there. Uh, and back then it was just an attribute on HDFS, right, you know, pretty simple stuff. It took a little bit of time to get to the picture on the right. But once we got there, we basically ended up in this vendor-driven uh, world where all of the Hadoop distributions uh, were kind of like just proliferating, right? And what ODPI set out to do uh, was to play a role of essentially a meta vendor, right? So instead of having all these different Hadoop distributions, ODPI wanted to have a core that would be absolutely the same between all the different distributions and then allow vendors to innovate on top, right? And if you haven't kept with the organization, you could say that this mission has been completely uh, fulfilled. Uh, it is a success and the last sort of member of the organization, IBM, uh, for example, discontinued its own distribution. Uh, because they are now feeling that because of the ODPI standardization, they can just offer all of the higher level uh, services on top of Fortinworks distribution. So Fortinworks has become the, you know, the, the vendor that basically gives the ODPI compatible distribution. And everybody else who was part of the organization, Pivotal IBM, even some of the other companies that actually have their own distributions, are now comfortable running just on Fortinworks. Uh, without the fear that uh, there would be incompatibilities or things that would break higher level products. So that was the initial mission uh, for DPI. And like I said, I mean, you could, you could say that that was a resounding success. Uh, now again, the question typically gets asked, what about Cloudera and Mapper? Uh, so let's address that. Uh, Mapper is a little bit easier to address. So Mapper has never been a true sort of open source company when it comes to the core distribution of Hadoop. Uh, as you all know, they substitute uh, HDFS with their own implementation, and they actually do a lot of their own implementations even outside of HDFS. Uh, so it's a, just a different way of doing things, and I don't think that Mapper will ever be congenial with what uh, ODPI is trying to do, but you know, who knows? Uh, Cloudera is a different animal, so Cloudera is a true open source company. The core distribution of the Cloudera uh, is derived from the Apache Hadoop, just like Fortinworks and any other distribution. Uh, but Cloudera has chosen not to join ODPI. Uh, but you could say that between at least seven or even ten different distributions that existed five years ago, and just two, Cloudera and Hortonworks, ODPI has been a reasonable success. So if, as an ISV, before 
before you needed to test against you know 10, you needed to talk to 10 different product managers, right? You know, in terms of roadmap. Now you basically need to just talk to two. And I think from that standpoint, maybe Cloudera will consider joining with API at some point. Because again, unlike Mapar, they actually don't have any uh, significant sort of uh, disagreements with where ODPI is going. It's more of a business disagreement that they have, you know, aligning with particular uh, uh, efforts within the Linux Foundation. So uh, with that in mind, you could basically say that ODPI is done and we should just close shop and you know, move on. Uh, but we actually now have a slightly different mission in mind. Uh, and that mission is trying to help the group uh, in the enterprise go from the pre-production phase into the production phase. And like I said, at ODPI, we basically have a lot of members, a lot of constituency who we talk to on a regular basis. So some of the companies include, you know, uh, guys like uh, G, you know, General Electric, uh, Seagate, you know, really big enterprises, you know, some of the big banks, uh, that sort of thing. And all of them are basically telling us the same narrative. So the narrative is that Hadoop is great, and despite all of the hype in the uh, press, it is only now, 2016, 2017, that Hadoop is actually moving from pre-production or pilot, you know, point solutions into a full-blown production. Uh, so again, we all are excited as technologists about Hadoop, and we've been excited for at least 10 years. But it is only now that the enterprises, and you know, I jokingly call them the companies on the East Coast, right? It is only now that the companies on the East Coast are embracing Hadoop in the same way that they embraced Oracle in the 80s, right? And if you look, by the way, just as a slide aside, if you look into how Oracle actually penetrated the enterprise, back then it was kind of the same story, right? You know, back then it wasn't really a settled question even about, you know, sort of relational versus object databases and stuff like that. And it took Oracle quite a bit of time to establish themselves as that solution provider, right? So ODPI is now focused on helping Hadoop basically go from, you know, just a cool, interesting technology to essentially a significant fundamental building block in all of the enterprise architectures. And if you look at this continuum, uh, we actually feel that there are sort of gates on that, on that continuum. And I kind of, you know, highlighted a few uh, of the ones that come up all the time. Uh, so when you just try, uh, when you just start using Hadoop uh, or, you know, uh, get to play with it, you know, data visualization and presentation become really important to, you know, embrace it. Uh, but once you actually move to the right on this continuum, things like data management become important, right? Because all of a sudden you actually have to put Hadoop into an overall enterprise architecture that is all about data security, data management, and data governance. And these principles are still something that Hadoop is, Hadoop ecosystem is not really super comfortable with, and I will talk about it uh, a little bit later. Uh, but let's actually uh, go through a few uh, considerations that we hear our enterprise constituency uh, mention to us, you know, talk about. And actually, I would like this session to end, you know, sooner so that I can open it up for suggestions, questions, and just, you know, your comments. Because I'm really curious to get as much feedback as possible, especially for those of you, from those of you uh, who happen to work in big enterprise companies. But again, so uh, let's see. So deployment type, right? You know, uh, as, a, as somebody who is supporting to do, you basically have to choose, you know, how you deploy it. And typically, what I see in most of the lab and you know pre-production pilot POC environments, it's whatever the team is, right? It's whatever the team that is putting the loop is comfortable with. But once you actually have to get into the enterprise-wide production, all of a sudden uh, it starts to be tied to corporate and departmental uh, procurement guidelines because all of a sudden it's a technology that this enterprise has to endure for at least five to ten years out, right? It's no longer a POC, it's no longer a sample, it's something that you actually have to support. Security and data governance is the same deal. Uh, it all begins with pretty much no security and data governance. Uh, do POCs are typically just, you know, you're proving business value of technology within a very limited team. You're not opening it up to, you know, consumption within the company. You are definitely not opening it up to BI people because in a typical enterprise, you know, you typically have a ratio of like one to 10 between data scientists and BI people. And if you have like, let's say, you know, 50 BI people, 100 BI people, uh, it means that you would typically have about, you know, five or half a dozen data scientists. And if you have half a dozen people just, you know, uh, working with technology, it's pretty easy to keep it secure and, you know, govern the data in a responsible way. 
But once you open it up, all of the same considerations kick in uh, that you know we all love and hate in a typical enterprise uh, setting. So software lifecycle management is the same deal. Uh, you basically don't really have to update or manage or support anything on the POC, right? But once it enters the same IT realm that everything else exists in the enterprise, you basically have to understand what are the support cycles, right? You know, what are the support policies from the vendor? How the compatibility matrix looks like, right? How to do compatible with all of the other bits and pieces that exist in the enterprise, and so on and so forth. So uh, all of that means that uh, enterprise Hadoop adoption, like I said, you know, is sort of just happening now. And if you look at the timeline, it's about 10 years, right? You know, 10 years out, which is kind of what you, we see in the uh, industry for most of the technologies that actually go from just a cool technology to a fundamental building block in the enterprise. And as you can see, ODPI hopes to play a very significant role in actually shifting, you know, Hadoop more and more towards the right and getting to do adopted as, uh, as a significant uh, part of the enterprise IT. Uh, so right now at ODPI, we're focusing on these three pillars. So we're focusing on security, data governance, and operations. And uh, the way we're doing it, you know, the way it's the organization is structured, is uh, we're basically trying to sort of be this connective tissue uh, between end users and upstream projects. Because let's face it, right? All the Hadoop ecosystem is developed as open source projects within the Apache Software Foundation. And historically, vendors, you know, platform vendors, were the mediating factor between the end users and the Apache. Because I'm, I'm an Apache guy myself, I'm a member of the foundation, been there for a long time. And I can tell you right away that Apache, especially for technologies like Hadoop, is just not set up to talk to the end users, especially if those end users you know, are the enterprise end users. We are the organization that was created and still exists for the sole purpose of the developers collaborating on technology in the most unconstrained possible way, uh, without corporate meddling, you know, at ASF, as a developer, you are expected to check out your corporate affiliation at the door. Uh, so you're just collaborating on a, on a set of technologies, right? And again, as a developer, of course you know some of the requirements because that's what brought you to the project to begin with. But a lot of the requirements that are outside of your purview are exactly the kind of requirements that are now, especially you know, especially now, I needed to bring Hadoop from again POCs and pre-production to the full production. And those requirements can only come from the enterprise end users, you know, ISVs and you know, on and the like. And it used to be that platform vendors were mediating that relationship. Now ODPI is trying to basically play this role of a meta vendor, where we are connecting directly to all of the enterprise end users and trying to bring that feedback directly into the upstream projects at Apache. So like I said, ODPI is part of the Linux Foundation, and Linux Foundation has been extremely successful doing it for Linux kernel itself and the Linux ecosystem itself, and we hope to bring some of that uh, to bear uh, on the new ecosystem. So how are we doing this? Uh, well, we have a few tools at our disposal. So we have special interest groups uh, which anybody can join. And this is just basically a verticalized interest group addressing a specific issue, right? It could be, let's say, real-time analytics on Hadoop, right? It could be uh, BI and data science. By the way, one of the existing six is BI and data science, and it's uh, supposed to come up with a report uh, pretty soon. So the end of the six functioning, which is typically, you know, the six functions for a year, uh, is a report that they generate, and that report is an opinion of the industry on a particular subject. So if you're interested, check out the SIGS uh, as an API. You know, you can just Google it, uh, or you can talk to me. Uh, then there are PMCs, project management committees, and these are the uh, sort of chosen uh, uh, representatives of the vendors, ICs, and users who are trying to shepherd certain areas of Hadoop. So far, so far we have PMCs for runtime, which basically constitutes, you know, YARN, HDFS, just the basic parts of runtime, and the uh, uh, most of the PMC's work is coming up with a set of guidelines for how the Hadoop distribution needs to behave, how it needs to be packaged, you know, things like that. Finally, we have a, a, a TSC on the on the far right, and this is just a governing body. You know, if there is any disagreement, TSC steps in, and you know, this is how you resolve disagreements at what you get. In the middle, this is the most interesting part, at least to me, and you know, for the purposes of today's 
presentation. This is the user advisory board, and that's where we get to talk to, to our users. That's where we get to run uh, research. And this is what a typical you know, software company would do in terms of product management, which is do it as a method. So based on this user advisory board, and by the way, I, I promised you to show you some, some uh, logos. So these are all current members of ODPI. So you can see some of the Hadoop companies, some of the SIs, you know, big SIs, like uh, Infosys, you know, AltiScale. There's actually a whole bunch of representatives here. Uh, but what's really important to us is that we actually end up getting some of the end users on this list as well. And based on the conversations with these end users, Here's a few things that I wanted to highlight for today's presentation. Uh, what do we all talk about most of the time? Like what topics have come up, let's say, in the past six months, uh, that which is constant, you know, reoccurrence of conversation, right? But here's a few, so let's actually start one by one. So like I told you, uh, it is very much perceived by everybody, including actually the analyst community even, that the number gap ecosystem today is data governance, right? Most of the other things, you know, they're either implemented in the Hadoop ecosystem itself, so you can use open source tools. Uh, it used to be, for example, just to give you an example, it used to be, let's say, that SQL compatibility of Hadoop was lagging. Uh, now with Hive 2 uh, catching up, it is very robust, you know, enterprise data warehouse that you can build on top of Hive. So that, we fixed that, right? You know, as Hadoop practitioners, we fixed that. But data governance is still a very much, you know, uh, uh, area that is in flux. Uh, and if you talk to your vendors about anything, talk about this, because this is also the area where the most incompatibility occurs, right? Like I told you, it used to be Hadoop distribution battles. Now it's, you know, Hadoop data governance battles. It's basically Clodera against IBM and Hortonworks, you know, it's Atlas against, you know, Sentry. It's all the same sort of like trying to figure out what project, you know, is, is the one that would give you all the value. Uh, now, yeah, ODPI has an opinion on that. And if you want to know our opinion, join the organization and bring your use case so we can test our opinion against your use case. Uh, but our opinion is very much sort of along the lines of uh, our constituency, which again is uh, IBM and Hortonworks uh, pivotal on the Hadoop distribution side. Uh, but there's always uh, bits and pieces that we do not actually have any way of standardizing. And those bits and pieces we have to talk to our ISPs to help and bring together. But again, this is this is number one gap today. Uh, so pay attention to it. Uh, and uh, if you're putting a you know uh, architecture around Hadoop together, this is something that we really need to be mindful of. Uh, another topic that comes up all the time, or at least it used to, uh, is that we kind of used to think that Hadoop will be the only uh, data platform in the enterprise, right? You know, the term data lake used to be thrown around quite a bit. So we wanted to, to be uh, the centerpiece of the data architecture and everything else would plug into it, right? So HDFS would be the only storage solution. Uh, Yarn would be the only scheduler. Now, I have to tell you it was a nice uh, aspirational uh, theory. Uh, it did not pan out. Uh, and pretty much everybody we talked to at ODPI is now telling us that they're basically building very heterogeneous data architectures where Hadoop is definitely one of the building blocks, very fundamental building block of the architecture, uh, but it's not the only one. It's not like you basically can just take, put Hadoop in production and forget about everything else. So here, for example, I'm uh, showing you the architecture from one of our, uh, uh, from one of our users, I would say. So this is a really big, you know, insurance uh, company that is putting together an architecture that has to do, like you can see at the, at, the, at the bottom, right? But it also has all the other bits and pieces as well. Now, again, they do not use Yarn, uh, but they use Hadoop for scale-out storage. And the, this architecture is actually very typical of what we see in ODPI, people are converging to, right? Uh, it's a three-tier architecture, so at the bottom you basically have lending and data science zone. And if you're running on-prem, HDFS is a really good solution, you do that. If you're running the cloud, lending zone happens to be S3, that's fine too. Uh, Azure has its own solution, you know, Google has its own solution. It's all really, really stable and good. Uh, all of these things now have Hadoop API, so you can actually get data in and out uh, of those uh, scale-out storage solutions. And typically at that level, you do your data science, right? You know, this is 
where you data scientists uh, are experimenting with Spark queries, you know, some of the machine learning queries. Uh, that's the first tier in the system. That's still a tier that doesn't really have to be super protected. So the number one gap in the duplicate system is not really that big of a deal at that level. Because you actually have a second tier in the system, and that's operational enterprise analytics. So that's how all of these companies are trying to externalize the work of data science teams to essentially the traditional BI constituency within the enterprise. So the theory goes that the data scientists will basically be creating data models. And if the data model is any good, it will then be consumed by a huge uh, constituency within the enterprise through the same BI tools that they all know and love, right? So that data model no longer happens to be like, let's say, a bunch of files in HDFS or a Hive table. The data model gets externalized into some enterprise data warehouse solution, right? Uh, it obviously has to be elastic, but it's something that, you know, in plain speed, you could hook up Tableau to, right? And again, you can try to hook Tableau to the uh, lower level of the system, New companies try it, uh, and it just happens to be that it's easier to have two tiers in the system compared to just one, right? And at the top level, you basically have in-memory serving layer, typically. That is how you connect your applications, your data-driven APIs, to essentially the same data models, the same data that exists in Hadoop. So three tiers in the system, you will see those in most of the architectural diagrams that get presented you know, these days. And again, as you can see, Hadoop is a very important building block here at the top level. Uh, so very quickly another topic that used to come up all the time, uh, and I just want to kind of highlight it for you if you have any doubts, uh, at least from the ODK standpoint, the jury, you know, the jury was out, but it is no longer out, the verdict is in. The Duke distributions are now a commodity. Uh, so if you're trying to evaluate your vendor just based on the strengths of the Hadoop distribution alone, you're doing it wrong. You basically have to evaluate your vendor on things like you know, their data governance capabilities, their data security capabilities, things like that. Just putting together a Hadoop distribution is no longer a business proposition. Now, the most interesting subject. And you know this one comes up all the time. So Hadoop in the cloud. Everybody's excited about the cloud. Uh, there was a, a Forrester report that basically put this in very sort of uh, uh, explicit terms. You know, they, they use the terminology of like go cloud or go home. You know, it's very sort of bombastic in a way. That's, you know, expected, but it's not really the full story. Uh, so what our constituencies, uh, you know, are telling us is that if you're running a small company, a small business, absolutely you have to be in the cloud. But you probably shouldn't be even running to the to begin with. You probably shouldn't be even building a big data management system to begin with. And there was a really good uh, anecdotal, but still a very good story from one of the uh, major credit card companies that basically offered their customers data access in the cloud for all of the transactions. And they were trying to figure out whether to give the customers Hadoop APIs or some other APIs or Spark APIs or whatever APIs. And they built a prototype. And then they went to their customers and you know tried to figure out whether they did the right thing and started talking about APIs. And in five minutes, it became apparent that what customers really needed was recommendation as a service, not a data management platform. They basically told them, like, look, guys, you give us tools to do data science, and we appreciate it, but it's useless to us. We're a small business. We're like a 100-people company. Give us a recommendation as a service. Analyze all of the transactions. We give you full rights and recommend something to us, right? You know, maybe tell us how to optimize our you know, supply chain. Or Tell us something, anything. We are not really interested in doing all of this data science mumbo jumbo. So again, if you're that type of a company, if you're a small company, yes, absolutely, you have to be in the cloud. But you probably shouldn't be building data management platforms to begin with. You probably shouldn't even be buying data management platforms. You should be buying sort of software as a service. Recommendation as a service would be a good example of that. You know, Salesforce is one huge example of that. But you know what I'm talking about, right? So if you happen to be on the other end of the spectrum, happens to be the size of Seagate or General Electric, then the cloud is high risk. Why? Because first of all, the data center is really not going away. Uh, you have investments in data centers all across the world, and not leveraging it just seems stupid. For General Electric, they actually have more data centers in more locations than Amazon today. Now again, the size of those data centers is smaller, 
But if you, for example, are trying to connect IoT data, you want that data to arrive at the closest data center possible and not travel across you know, the globe to the internet, right? So the cloud is hybrid, the data center is not going away, uh, and existing social processing that you're still doing today will be complemented by local processing. Uh, some of those companies try to do calculations of what would it take for them to actually move 100% to the public cloud, and every single one of them came back, came back with the realization that it would be absolutely cost prohibitive. So again, if you happen to be at the absolute other end of the spectrum, uh, you really have to run a hybrid cloud story, and your architecture has become really sophisticated. Uh, so at one of the Hadoop summits, actually the guy from Seagate was presenting their architecture. I highly recommend looking it up, just you know, look up Hadoop summits uh, Seagate. Uh, and it was really, really sophisticated in what they were doing. And again, Hadoop was part of it, but not all of it. Now finally, this, this is actually my favorite subject. Uh, today, Hadoop is still Hadoop in the enterprise is still a really big help to the mostly traditional BI approach to data analytics. And again, that is changing. You know, we get data science, you know, throwing in into the BI mix as well. But in the enterprise today, it is only the beginning of the journey when they are trying to go through this final step of digital transformation, where they are trying to mediate their relationship with the customer through application, right? And the ultimate example of what I'm talking about would be all of these internet companies that are now threatening traditional enterprises, right? Uh, Airbnb threatening, you know, traditional hotel chains, you know, Uber threatening, you know, traditional taxi companies, you know, all of those examples. Why? Well, there is a whole bunch of reasons, but in my opinion, one of the biggest reasons is that all of these, you know, disruptors are essentially using applications as the main way of mediating the relationship with their customers and their suppliers. So if I'm an Uber supplier, if I'm an Uber driver, my relationship with the company is 100% mediated through an application. There's no way for me to like do anything else. In fact, calling Uber you know, at a call center is actually a pretty bad experience from what I'm being told, right? If I'm a consumer of the company, yeah, my whole relationship, my whole interaction with the company is mediated through an application, right? There's absolutely no way for me to call somebody, right? You know, it's like everything is mediated through the app. And once you see more and more traditional enterprises move in that category, you will basically see applications that generate so much data exhaust that where that data exhaust exists, that will be the center of gravity for your analytics. Or to put it in a different way, if you have your applications running in the Google Cloud, then you will be doing analytics in the Google Cloud. If you have your applications running in Amazon Cloud, you will be doing analytics in the Amazon Cloud. That hasn't happened yet, so uh, it's just the beginning of the process of the traditional enterprises sort of embracing more of the Silicon Valley model of you know, doing business. But once it happens in mass, and I will give it you know, maybe five years, you will see very different ways of deciding where the analytics platform belongs compared to what we're doing today. So that's just a caution mark there. I guess we all can see. So finally, uh, a subject that comes up all the time is what's the relationship between Apache Software Foundation, Linux Foundation, and different vendors. So like I told you, uh, Linux Foundation is the uh, mother corporation for ODPI. So you know that's the relationship. And between ASF and vendors, we're trying to play a role of a meta vendor, uh, trying to connect you know, the uh, uh, requirements of the end users to the Apache Software Foundation project. ODPI itself recognizes the value of ASF. We absolutely love ASF. There is no adversarial relationship between ODPI and ASF. ODPI happens to be a gold sponsor of Apache Software Foundation. And we all realize that without the innovation that's happening at ASF, we won't be here today, right? We only can do this because there are developers upon developers who are contributing code to the Apache Software Foundation. And all we are trying to do is to give them enough feedback to realize what is the most important thing for them to do. Uh, so that's that's basically what you carry, right? Uh, you know, this is the virtuous cycle that we're trying to enable, and uh, you know, just basically kind of trying to optimize software supply chain in a way. Uh, so you can engage with us. ODPI is a completely open organization. So uh, join ODPI six. You know, here's the URL for you. Uh, you can go and review the specs. You know that ODPI is putting out. Those are the standard specifications that help to do distribution. 
companies, you know, what Hadoop distribution needs to look like. Uh, you can join or listen in on our user advisory boards, uh, or you can bring your own feedback and your own uh, use cases to our user advisory boards. And if you happen to be one of the companies that may be interested in participating in all of these activities, you can actually formally join on DPI and get your logo on the page that I was showing you a few slides ago. So that's basically it. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much.